Well, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, welcome you to our scripture and ministry lecture. Uh, my name is Steve Mathewson. I'm an area pastor and also serve on the board of the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. And it's uh, my privilege uh, today to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sandra Richter. Uh, I will do that in just a moment, but uh, I'd like to uh, lead us in prayer. Again, uh, welcome to uh, all of you. Great to see some uh, faculty and students and uh, area pastors. And uh, I know that there are uh, people as well that are watching on uh, live stream. So to all of you, welcome. Uh, would you join me as I lead us in prayer? Father, your name and your renown is the desire of our hearts. And I pray that you will help us this afternoon as we think uh, deeply about uh, the image of God, about uh, creation and the way that uh, prophet Isaiah draws on uh, those themes. Uh, Lord, I pray that what we hear uh, today will be helpful to us in, in forming us in, in Christ and also helpful to us as we think about uh, serving you, preaching, and teaching scripture. Uh, Lord, I thank you so much for uh, Dr. Richter and her willingness to come and to speak to us. I pray that uh, she'll feel welcome, that your spirit will uh, empower her as she speaks to us today. Uh, Father, thank you for this privilege that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is a privilege to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Sandra, Rick Sandra Richter. Uh, she is professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Uh, previously, she served as a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary for nine years and uh, Wesley Biblical Seminary for four years before that. Uh, she has a, a Master of Arts degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and a PhD uh, from Harvard in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and Hebrew Bible. Uh, my introduction to Dr. Richter came from my brother Mark, who is on staff at a church in Lincoln, Nebraska. I believe he's watching a uh, live stream today, so uh, hello, Mark. Uh, but uh, he told me about, uh, he says, you, you've got to uh, you, you read uh, Sandra Richter's book, uh, The Epic of Eden. And, uh, and I was so glad for the recommendation, a uh, uh, Christian entry into the Old Testament. And and he said, you'll find it fascinating, and it, it's been worth the, the read. And then uh, uh, met her as well, finally in person at uh, a session for the Evangelical Theological Society. And, and I've appreciated her work, and I was thrilled to find out that she'd be moving into our neighborhood to be uh, nearby at Wheaton College. Uh, her family, let me tell you just a little bit about her family. Uh, her husband, uh, Stephen Sukalis, uh, he is... Uh, uh, PhD as well, works in comparative religion, uh, works with Zondervan, and also uh, does some teaching at Emmaus Bible Seminary in Haiti. Uh, of uh, great interest to you might be that his first career was as a rock star and an Elvis impersonator. Uh, so who says that uh, Bible scholars and uh, theologians don't have some uh, interesting personal sides to them? Uh, Sandra says that she has two perfect daughters, and if she says that when they are 14 and 11, uh, she's got to be right. If they're perfect at that age, uh, they are perfect. Uh, their names are Noel and Elise. And so it's a privilege to have her uh, here today. Uh, would you uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Sandra Richter? Thank you. They are perfect, and as I tell my students, don't argue with me, I still have the grade book in my hand. So it is such an honor to be here. It truly is. The Carl F. Henry Center for Theological Understanding. What a wonderful endowment and a wonderful opportunity for Trinity. And I'm looking across this room at people who are my mentors and my friends and my past students and my current students, actually, as well, who've made the trek. And I am uh, thrilled to be here. Thank you, Tom McCall, for the invitation. Jeffrey and Heather, um, thank you for making all this happen. Is, are you happy with this mic? Yes? I don't need to move it. All right. <clears throat> um, thank you for having me here. As you all know, the aim for the Creation Project has been to broaden the church's understanding of the doctrines of creation, to ponder 
that breathtaking moment when the creator hurled the cosmos into place from as many perspectives as we can. To investigate the stunning perfection of his works with all the intellectual and emotional capacity we can muster. And I am thrilled to be a part of that. As we consider the heavens, the work of his fingers, the moon, the stars which he has ordained, we who are in his image must ask, right along with the psalmist, in light of who you are, what is humanity that you should take thought of them? The child of Adam, that you should care for him. This is the topic of my talk, uh, the servant, the idol, and the image of God. And we will ponder this topic via the lens of one of the greatest theologians of all time. That theologian, of course, is the prophet Isaiah. So uh, we're going to launch with the book itself. I um, was supposed to get this to Heather, but didn't get it to her quite early enough. If you want a copy, I'm perfectly happy to get it for you. As you know, this is an enormous and enormously complex text. The book of Isaiah is 66 compelling and overwhelming chapters from a man who in our day would surely carry a THD and a PhD, have nearly as many publications as K. Lawson Younger, and a German Habilitation to throw into the mix as well. But lucky for us, the author himself provides us a roadmap to his magna opus. And as is normative for all of the prophetic books, the order of his oracles has as much to say to us about his message as do the content of the oracles themselves. So what is the key? Well, lucky for us, our author actually offers us a key. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, summarizes Isaiah's thesis. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. In other words, this book, as has been recognized many, many times, takes a major shift at chapter 40. And the shift has to do with the former things and the latter things. Chapters 1 through 39 report the former things. I like to speak of this section of the book as Israel as she was. Chapters 40 through 66 speak to us of the latter things. I like to speak of this as Israel as she will be. In other words, like so many of the prophetic books, our rhetorician leads with judgment and brings it home with the hope of redemption. Thus, whereas chapter one of this book details Yahweh's covenant lawsuit against his people, introducing the problem of the book, in chapter 66, this one whose hand has made all these things announces that he is making a new heavens and a new earth. Can a land be born in a single day? Well, in the hands of the one who first hurled the cosmos into place, yes, Yes, it can, according to our great prophet. Now, in the midst of this book is, the, in the second half, embedded in the very heart of the latter things is a pivotal conflict between two critical character, characters that is too often missed. Here, in this section, the protagonist, who is our hero, is, as is often the case in any great epic, not obviously the hero. And the antagonist? is as slick and as smart and alluring as any great villain should be. Who are they? Well, as the title of my lecture suggests, these are the servant and the idol. One, if he triumphs, is the ultimate solution. The other, if he prevails, will in his ascension dispossess the very people who have offered them him their allegiance. This villain of all villains is the idol. So how will the people of God defend themselves? How will they unmask the pretender? How will they embrace their true hero who is the ability to lead them into a restored identity, the new humanity of God's new heavens and new earth? How will they resist the power of darkness that will ultimately destroy them? Isaiah's answer is simple. The people of God must recognize who their creator is and therefore and therefore, who they are. Indeed, if the people of God will realize what it means 
to be made in the image of God, then there's hope. So we turn first to Isaiah's ultimate solution, the servant. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. Now it's important for us to realize that there are at least two servants in Isaiah's book, at least. The first is actually Israel herself. Israel is spoken of multiple times throughout the book as Yahweh's servant. In fact, if I were to ask a random student like Catherine Brightly, perhaps, to do a book study on this book, she would come up with dozens and dozens of references to Yahweh as is Israel as Yahweh's servant. How does Israel do as Yahweh's servant? Well, we find first that Israel is corrupt. One brief quotation, ah, sinful nation, a people laden down with iniquity, the offspring of evildoers, sons who deal corruptly. They've forsaken Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. As you read through chapter one of this book, you are struck by the fact that Yahweh has pursued every possible method to convince, allure, court, even seduce his people into repentance, and yet they have refused. How is Israel as Yahweh's servant? They are blind and they are deaf. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is as blind as my servant, or as deaf as the messenger whom I sent? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? This is the first servant of Isaiah's book. And as is obvious by these quotations, this servant has failed miserably to stand as the witness of Yahweh in the court of the nations. But then we are introduced to a second servant. A second servant who is the most enigmatic individual of the Old Testament as I have ever encountered. This second servant is known to us primarily through the corpus of the second portion of Isaiah, which we know as the servant songs. This servant has stirred centuries, millennia of debate. We know this individual through the songs, but this servant remains within the book itself a mystery. How would we characterize this servant? In the first song, we read that this servant is not blind. Rather, this servant sees clearly God's will and thereby brings about justice, a light for the Gentiles. This servant is not deaf. Rather, this one hears clearly God's command. This one rescues the the exiles and again becomes a light for the Gentiles. We read that this servant is not disobedient or disdainful of the Holy One of Israel. Rather, this one obeys faithfully, one who truly knows Yahweh and suffers as a result. True light versus false light. And then the most mysterious song of all. This servant is one whose death will somehow deliver his people from their failures, and yet this one will be exalted. Others will add chapter 61 of Isaiah as a fifth song to the corpus, but all stand with the same question. Who? Who could this person be? And so we ask the same question. Who is the servant? Is this an individual or is this a group? Or is it both? And how can it be both? As it says on your outline, how can a second Israel save a first Israel? Or how could one man actually embody a nation? And so as the uh, centuries have ticked by, individuals have proposed that the servant might indeed be Israel. But then again, how can Israel die for Israel? Or perhaps this is the remnant of Israel or ideal Israel. But if indeed this one perishes for the sake of the nation, where does the remnant go? Or perhaps this is first Isaiah, the prophet often theorized as responsible for these first 39 chapters. Or is it Jeremiah? Or is it Deutero Isaiah, the one hypothesized to be responsible for the second half 
of the book? Or perhaps are we looking at some unknown prophet of the exile, or Zerubbabel, or Moses, or Hezekiah? It would be difficult for us to find one hero of the story of Israel who's not been proposed as this potential servant. As many have pointed out, you could probably limp through the first three of these servant songs with any one of these figures in mind. But there is no way to resolve the final servant song with the identity of anyone who stands on the screen. And as a result, many have hypothesized that the servant of Isaiah is indeed Jesus the Christ. And as we look at this fourth and final servant song, we read that as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Hmm. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. Well, the prophet who speaks, the great theologian who identifies this text, does not believe in human sacrifice. The great theologian who speaks these words cannot yet know that there is a babe to be born in a manger in Bethlehem. And yet he speaks of this one all the same. Mysterious, enigmatic, beyond a human figure, as my uh, divinity school students at Harvard University often indicated to me. Someone not identified by the interplay between the former and the latter things, which is our theologian's thesis. In light of this mystery, Brevard Childs makes this statement. This observation implies that in regard to this portion of the message of 2nd Isaiah, the canonical process preserved the material in a form, the significance of which was not fully understood. This is about as close to revelation as you're going to get here. The diversity within the witness could not be resolved in terms of Israel's past experience. Rather, the past would have to receive its meaning from the future. Hmm. Now let's turn to the other character in the book of Isaiah, the villain, the one to whom the servant is juxtaposed, the one literary types would describe as the seducer. This antagonist appears to be a good guy in the larger Israelite experience, but as the story unfolds, is eventually exposed as the villain, like the two women in The Mask the blonde versus the brunette, the firm with Tom Cruise, the devil's advocate with Keanu Reeves, or like Barty Crouch's sinister impersonation of the inimitable Mad-Eye Moody in the Goblet of Fire. Who is the good guy? Who is the bad guy? In Israel's experience, this other character, the seducer, is indeed the idol. Now, I realize that to you and to me, it is obvious that the idol is the pretender the villain, but not so for Israel. Therefore, Isaiah speaks, I've declared them to you long ago, the former things. Before they took place, I, Yahweh, proclaimed them to you so that you would not say my idol has done them, my grave image, my molten image has commanded them. Yahweh is jealous of this villain, jealous for the well-being of his people because he knows that this is ultimately the villain of the tale. So let us pause and consider how the ancients spoke of this villain that they do not necessarily recognize as a villain. The idol in the language of the ancient Near East would not have been spoken of as an idol. Rather, the terminology applied to this character would be the term Selim or the term Elohim, image or God. Indeed, when the diplomats of Assyria approached Hezekiah's Jerusalem in order to attempt to negotiate a surrender treaty, the Rav Shaka shouted out for all the men on the wall to hear, has any one of the gods of the nations delivered this land from the hand of the kings of Assyria? He does not call them idols, he calls them gods. Who among 
Well, that's the watch, so you're in trouble. <laughs> Who among all the gods of the land from the ha- have delivered from the ki- hands of the kings of Assyria? Who among all the gods has delivered from my hand? And so Hezekiah prayed to his God. Indeed, O Yahweh, the kings of Assyria have cast all the gods of these other nations into the fire. So please, hear me. Prove your identity as the only true God and deliver us. How can you cast a god into the fire? And the answer is, you cast an idol into the fire. So Israel's neighbors and Israel herself, more often than not, would refer to what you call the idol as a god. In Israel's world, what we know as the idol would have been referred to as deity because the incarnate image of that deity, that would be the tselem, or what you know as the idol, was understood as the animate representation of the God himself. And so what we know as an idol, they would know as a tselem, an animate incarnation of their deity. But one of the most interesting details about Isaiah's rhetoric regarding the idol, and really much of the Bible's treatment on the topic, is that Isaiah does not choose to use this vocabulary. Rather, Isaiah violates his neighbor's vocabulary, will not use the standard terminology when he refers to these deities or their animate images. Whereas the nations referred to them as gods, Isaiah calls them pestle or pestilim. As you can see on the slide, as a verb, this word is actually very common in the ancient Near East. It simply means, as a verb, uh, to craft, to sculpt, or to hewn. As a noun, it means uh, to be something crafted, hewn, or sculpted. In other words, our biblical writers are making use of vocabulary which is familiar to their audience, to craft, to hew, but they are creating a noun by which to speak of these foreign deities. Although you will find the verb frequently among Israel's neighbors, you will never find the noun. What does Isaiah's word mean? That which is hewn, that which is sculpted, that which is made, what does it communicate? These gods that you are worshiping are things made. They are things hewn, things you sculpted with your own hands, comma, stupid, period. These are not gods. They are not animate. These are things made. The first occurrence of this word is found in the Ten Commandments. Specifically, that critical expansion of the first commandment. You shall have no Elohim, no gods before me. Indeed, you shall not make for yourself a pestle or any likeness of what is in the heaven above or on the earth beneath. The other place where you will find this noun, pestle, something that you made with your hands, comma, stupid, all over the biblical text is with our theologian, Isaiah who picks up this word and uses it over and over and over again to describe the great villain, the idol. Most specifically, he utilizes this word in his famous idol parody poems. We'll pick up the most famous of his idol parody poems here in Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah starts by reminding Israel of who made them in the first place place. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, even Israel whom I have chosen, thus says Yahweh who made you, who formed you from the womb, who made who? I made you. He goes on to speak to Israel regarding their calling to serve as witnesses of the Almighty. And yet the fact then rather than standing as witnesses, they have instead turned their allegiance to things they've made with their own hands. He moves on to begin to speak about the absurdity of humans making gods. 
the complete and utter insanity of the thing created, making the thing that cannot be created. And as the passage continue, he speaks with pointed sarcasm regarding the limits of the craftsman who is actually fashioning Yatsar, if you know your creation vocabulary, a god. And he concludes by speaking of how Israel's resultant condition is as blind and as deaf and as inanimate as the gods they claim to make. And so we turn to Isaiah chapter 44, 12, and we see the parallelism of the prophet. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool, and the man works it with the coals. He hammers it and fashions it. He works it with his strong arm. Even the human becomes hungry because of his limitations, so that he has no strength, and he must pause and drink water lest he faint. This most famous of these poems in Isaiah 44 describes the crafting of an idol, and Isaiah mocks his audience. How could a limited human attempt to make a god? He goes on, and he speaks of the human who hews a tree, stretching forth a plumb line, outlining with, with red chalk. He fashions it with scraping tools, and with a compass, the human designs it. He makes it like the form of a man, according to the beauty of Adam, in order to be enthroned in a house, a temple. So with great sarcasm and pointed wit, the prophet goes on to say, you plant the tree, but it's the rain that makes it grow. You burn the tree to keep yourself warm and bake your bread, and with the other half, you make a god, and you fall down in front of it and pray, deliver me, for thou art my god. The prophet roars, how stupid are you? Can't you see? You can't even make the tree grow. Without me, your strength fails while you work. Yet, you think your own creation can save you. When I'm right here, your creator awaiting your worship. The problem is it made explicit by this image coming out of ancient Mesopotamia. Here we see they have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. We as humans need a deity who is both imminent right here with us and transcendent, able to deal with the vagaries of the universe. How do our ancient polytheists deal with this problem? Well, they create local incarnations of their gods. Incarnations that are here with us, that we can serve, but who are also ritually empowered to be transcendent. Because you see, even the pagans knew that humans should not be making gods. But once we have made them, we need to make them gods. And the solution that they have arrived at is a ritual solution. What is that ritual solution? Well, in the ancient world, it is known as the Babylonian Miss P ritual. The mission of the Miss P ritual, which literally means the opening of the mouth, the mission is to make an Elohim, a human making an Elohim. Now we have literary evidence for this particular ritual from the days of Gudea that takes us back to before Abraham's era all the way to Nebuchadnezzar II. That's the fellow who takes down Jerusalem in 586 BC. In other words, this ritual is broadly known and broadly practiced in Isaiah's world. How does it work? Well, we have the mission, so far so good, we're going to make use of our ability to interact with the divine. So the first step will be divination, where the priests of a particular temple actually ask the gods, do you approve, do you approve that we might actually create an incarnation of you, O great God, a Selim? And of course, the deity will respond, and if he gives us permission, then the Selim, the image, is actually crafted. 
The crafting will be done by the finest of sculptors, and the finest of materials will be used. The statue will be coated in gold or in silver, the eyes set with jewels, the clothing uh, beyond cost for the average citizen. And that image will be crafted in a very specific sacred space within the temple itself. So far, so good. Now we have ourselves one beautiful statue. But the statue, of course, is just a statue. So what will the ancients do? To be a god, this statue, this incarnation must live. And so the ancients will need to animate their statue. How will we animate it? Well, the first step is that the image will be transferred to a sacred garden. Notice the words that I'm highlighting. They will become more important as we move forward. The statue will be transferred to a sacred garden somewhere in the temple precinct. And in this garden, it will be placed with its face pointed toward the sunrise. And our priests and our craftsmen will depart the sacred precinct. At dawn, they will return. And when they return, our priests and our craftsmen will now look at this beautiful, perfect statue as the light of the dawn catches both the glinting metals on its surface and the sacred waters moving through the tamarisk canal placed upon the birthing bricks of the goddess facing the east, and they will declare, look what the gods have birthed. And they will declare in ritual fashion that this statue has been born, born in heaven, made on earth, transferred into our realm. And so just as the process would be with a human baby, the next step will be the mouth washing, the Miss P ritual. As we in applied health care today would take a suction tube and suction out the mouth of a newborn baby and wipe the various um, fluids of birth from its eyes and ears, so too these would wash out the mouth and the eyes and the ears of their newborn deity. Then the craftsmen themselves, then they would wash the image with water as we would a newborn child. The craftsmen themselves would ritually disassociate themselves from the birth of the statue. In other words, they would take every tool that they had utilized in the birthing process, they would sacrifice a ritual animal, typically a sheep. They would wrap their tools in a cloth, place those tools within the carcass of the ritual animal. They would ceremonially detach their own hands, not literally, place that into the body of the sheep as well, and cast the evidence that this creature had been made not born into the sea, actually into the river divine gestation has occurred. In the words of Michael Dick, the womb-like tamarisk trough has been filled with the river's fructifying semen. The tamarisk trough is placed on the bricks of the birth goddess. The invocation of the gods has birthed a deity. This is how the animate, imminent incarnation of a deity occurred in the ancient world. From the earliest days of writing in Mesopotamia until the fall of Israel's monarchy, this is how a god was made. When the god was complete, it was then installed in the temple. And from this point forward, this animate deity must be fed, must be clothed, must even be taken out to visit its relatives and go hunting. This is the tselem of the deity incarnate and installed in the temple. So let us at last circle back to the creation narrative. What is the conversation that our great theologian is having with Genesis 1 and 2? Then Yahweh Elohim crafted Yetzar, the human from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the human, who was not animate, became animate. 
And Yahweh Elohim planted a garden toward the east, a garden that has been recognized by hundreds of theologians as a paradigm for a temple. And he installed the human whom he had fashioned. Do you hear it? In what some have called a children's tale, we have a sophisticated critique of one of the most elevated practices of the ancient world. What does it communicate? Yahweh has fashioned his own tselem, his own local animate reflection of himself. Because gods can make tselem, humans can't. This is why the religion of Israel is an iconic. This is why Israel was forbidden to make images of their God. Because God has already made his own image, and that image is you. What are the biblical implications of Isaiah's conversation with the creation narrative? We read that humanity was created in the tselem, the image of God. This is repeated in both Genesis 1 with the technical terminology of tselem, and in Genesis 2 in the narrative of the creation, animation, and installation of our creature. We read that God animates and installs this image in his sacred garden. But we all know the tale, that humanity rebels refusing their divinely ordained role and chooses instead, as Isaiah details, the blindness and the deafness of their own idols. These statues are not animate. God's Selim is animate. And God's Selim has enacted the <coughs> ultimate act of betrayal by refusing their role and seeing, placing that role on the inanimate idols of their own making. In other words, the first servant failed. So God redeems. He chooses a new covenant people. He rescues, redeems, and restores. And he restores these people to his land and his purposes. And he places his presence in their midst. This is Israel. Called, as was the first servant, to do what? to demonstrate his character to the nations, to be a light to the world, to stand as a witness of the one in whose image they have been made. But as Isaiah chronicles for 39 chapters, this servant fails as well. So what will we do? And we return to Isaiah's ultimate solution. The hero of this text, the most unlikely of heroes, the servant. And we read again Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? What an impossible tale. And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and equated with grief and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Sorry, I can't ever get through this passage. He was crushed by our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall in him. This mysterious figure, the one whom Brevard Childs tells us that even Isaiah himself could not identify, the one whose identity, quote, could not be resolved in terms of Israel's past experience, rather the past would have to receive its meaning from the future, the one whom our New Testament writers identify as both the type man of Israel, the one who could embody a nation, a second Israel who could indeed save the first, the second Adam who is indeed the recreation of the Tselem that was the first Adam intended in the garden. This is the answer to the puzzle. And so our New Testament writers latch on to this reality. 
In Matthew 8, 14 through 17, we read the gospel writer saying, yes, yes, this is the one. He himself took our infirmities. In John 12, we read the gospel writer, even after he had performed so many miracles in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He has blinded their eyes. And perhaps my favorite allusion is Matthew chapter 11, when John the Baptist is dying in prison, and he knows that his days are numbered. And he sends his disciples to his cousin, the Christ, and says, are you the one, or am I rotting in this prison in vain? And Jesus turns to the disciples, and he quotes Isaiah 61. He says, tell him that the blind see, tell him that the lame walk, tell him that good news is being announced to the poor. Code language, tell him I'm the one. So how does this impact our theology? And here we are sitting in the Carl F. Henry Center for Theological Inquiry. It affects our theology because as this great prophet is wont to do, he connects Eden to the New Jerusalem. He pulls the great story together. He teaches us that Jesus the Christ has come as the image, the tselem, of the invisible God. Jesus the Christ is termed by our New Testament writers as the firstborn over all creation. Does Paul choose this language randomly? Certainly not. Indeed, the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. He is not just any Selim. He is the Selim. And this one who is designed to be the ultimate light for the nations has come to this new Israel so that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Reconformed, I would throw in, to the Selim of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Looking at Isaiah's message again, what do we read? That the first servant and the second servant, Israel, were commissioned to be Yahweh's witnesses. You are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Because if we know who he is, we know who we are. Before me there was no God form, and there will be none after me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, there is no strange God, there is no idol among you. So you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and I am God. And so in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we hear the commission reapplied. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be what? My witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Indeed, we have been tasked as the new Israel with the same role as the first Adam, the same role as Israel, and it has been made possible by the one who is made exactly in his image. Isaiah speaks, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And so the gospel writer says to this new servant, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then the great servant takes that task and turns to his newly formed people and commissions us. You are now the light of the world. If you will allow yourselves to be reconformed to the image, you will fulfill the first and ultimate task. Indeed, 
Jesus the Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And so we come full circle. What was the ultimate problem? A humanity who refused their role as the Tselem of the Almighty and chose instead to make a God in their own image. And as a result, became as dead and blind and deaf as the idols they worshiped. What is the ultimate solution? A new servant. One who can embody the original intent of the creator, who can both be and represent and redeem the very ones who have failed in their calling. And so he comes, the exact image of the Almighty in the form of Adam. And if we will agree to be conformed to his image, then at last we can be the Tselem of the Almighty, a light to the nations, a witness to the peoples. Isaiah saw it on the horizon. He did not fully understand it. It awaited Israel's future to fulfill it. But he understood that a second Adam must come. And he believed so that we might believe as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rector, for a wonderful lecture. Very, very moving and very stimulating. We're going to have a, a time for Q&A. It's uh, about 1.52. We can go till uh, 2.30 if you still have uh, uh, questions. So I will open it up in just a moment. Uh, we will ask you to come to uh, one of the mics on either side here of the, the area in the front. And uh, please don't uh, trip all over each other and, and fight for those. But you know what it's like? It always takes one person to, to be bold and to get started. So please do that. But maybe I will uh, start with a question. Actually, mm -hmm. you, you already answered this, but mm -hmm. it might be worth uh, revisiting. I, I thought this was such a great point you made. But in, in Exodus 20, verse 4, the, the second mm -hmm. of the ten words, you know, we read, you shall not make for yourself uh, petzel. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, the biblical writer doesn't seem to make the, the connection or, or, you know, as, as the ten words are being given, the connection isn't made. But, but that's, that's the, very, the very reason that why Israel wouldn't do that is because they were... Uh, it's Salem, they were image mm -hmm. of God. And I, I guess I've always thought about that, but thought, well, Scripture doesn't, you know, it doesn't make the connection as explicitly as we'd like. But I think what you're saying is the connection's there. It's there mm -hmm. from Genesis 2. Mm -hmm. it, it just has to be, uh, you know, understood mm -hmm. in, in light of, of the whole, uh, you know, body of what Scripture says. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if somebody said to you, well, the connection isn't there, I think I know what your answer mm -hmm. would be, but what would you say to them? Well, again, our focus on the original author's vocabulary is very important. This is not random. This is not intended. This is not a word you're going to find in any other uh, ritual liturgical uh, mm -hmm. material. So when uh, the writer of the Ten Commandments and Isaiah pick up this term, it is, uh, it, it is a slur. It is intended as a slap across the face. In fact, the, the urban legend regarding uh, George H.W. Bush and his pronunciation of Saddam Hussein's name, have you heard this urban legend yet? I can't confirm it. But for those of you who uh, lived through that era or remember that era, uh, whenever uh, the first President Bush would speak Saddam's name, he would not say Saddam, he would say Saddam. Do you remember this? And a lot of people attributed it to his Texas accent. But of course, Bush was not stupid, and he had advisors. And so the urgent urban legend is that he was intentionally speaking the word Saddam every time, because Saddam in Arabic is a slur. It is an insult. And so every time a news broadcast was sent over the airways, Bush was intentionally insulting the man. This is the urban legend. Um, this is exactly what Isaiah is doing. He is intentionally insulting, and he is in intentionally dividing, and Exodus is doing the same thing. There is plenty of vocabulary for God and image and uh, any, any sort of deity, and instead he chooses a verb that everyone in his audience would recognize as you made it with your own hands. Hmm. 
This is why the study of original languages is absolutely critical to your theological education. Right, Richard? Yes. OK, yes. go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Please make your way to uh, one of the mics on the side. Well, and I would love to hear aha moments as well. Um, in some ways, this lecture is very self-contained. Um, there's not a lot of outside data, but I'm hoping that dots got connected for many of you that have never been connected before. Yeah, this was a fantastic lecture. Thank you very much you. for for setting this out before us. This Mies P connection and mm -hmm. so on is very helpful in terms of the context in which Israel would be reading a lot of this material. Um, one question that I've had uh, that that uh, you didn't talk about this, but you can't talk about everything when you talk about Isaiah's servant all at once. Mm. <laughs> but um, I've wondered. Uh, how much the suffering of the servant hmm. is connected with the whole uh, the prophets as servants hmm. and how much that leads into how he develops the servant terminology uh, in in the songs um, uh, and this is an issue that I, that I think may help us to understand how he gets there is what I'm trying to say mm. in terms of the suffering of the servant and the significance of that in Isaiah 53. Uh, because then we have a whole kind of uh, another set of mm -hmm. things that were internal to Israel that would push us into our understanding of it. And Jesus talked about himself as being that prophet, right? And, mm -hmm. and so on. And so there's a lot that can be done with that. But And you know, they have Hebrews 1 and and mm -hmm. so on, and the connections there. So I just wonder if you've thought through that, if you have any particular thoughts about the, the linkage there between the prophet and the suffering of the prophets in the mm -hmm. Old Testament, and how that leads into this ultimate suffering. Uh, the, and the ultimate identity of Jesus as prophet? Yeah. Are these the connections we're yes. making? Yes, well, various. Okay. Ultimate, he's ultimate, mm -hmm. so many different things. <laughs> right, right. And the writer of Hebrews, of course, can't leave that alone, right? Um, so don't go yet, because um, we, I, I told the Q&A people before we started that I'm going to have more resources in this room to answer Q&A than um, ever happens in, in my experience. So you're thinking in terms that the prophet's role as being this, in some ways, un, having this unfortunate calling of being a rhetorician in a context in which rather than operating in the standard rules of rhetoric, which is find out what your audience wants to hear and kind of lure them forward, instead is regularly called to slap them upside the head mm -hmm. and therefore is um, generally a figure who suffers. Mm -hmm. And that this identity of the prophet informs the servant's role because Jesus himself will ultimately be prophet as well. Um, are there more? Talk to me. What would you, yeah, well, what would you add in there? Well, I, I, I could add, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the last of the Beatitudes, there's mm -hmm. a shift to the you from the, mm. from the third person to the you. And, and in it, uh, it talks about, uh, uh, blessed are you when you suffer. Mm. Uh, because, and that it ends because that way you're like the prophets of the Old Testament. Okay. And so it continues on into the ethos of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, f uh, from there, and I've wondered about uh, how much that links us as the ones who are in Christ to being servants as well, mm -hmm. as the very ethos mm -hmm. of being the 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 servants who whatever comes we 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 witness through it. Yeah. Okay, including suffering mm -hmm. and all that comes with. Uh, being light in the midst of, our, of darkness. And that being made in his image involves mm -hmm. the fact that in this exiled world, yeah. we will be a target over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah. Um, amen. <laughs> it would be my response. I, I think it's, a, it's an important, it's a very important allusion in thesis yeah. to our character and his character. Yeah. yeah. Well, it helps me. And, and I just, thanks again for this wonderful oh, lecture. Absolutely. Thank you.
I'm going to use this to stir up more conversation. Ready? Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, thank you uh, very much. My name is Clinton Nollers. I'm one of the research fellows yes. here. And I just found your talk so, uh, so interesting and illuminating uh, and, and very new to me, uh, this material. Mm. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, like the first time I went to a, a Passover cedar done by mm. uh, Jewish believers. And you see this whole line of so the Passover lamb going right from the beginning all the way through Revelation. And so what I'd be interested to know is that I assume that there is a history to these insights within the history of interpretation. And I'm wondering, could you uh, talk a little bit about um, where this uh, understanding of the image in the garden in Isaiah, in Colossians, uh, mm -hmm. what the history of that interpretation has been? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there were a lot of, first of all, the servant himself is probably the most debated figure in the Old Testament, is that safe to say? Um, and the interpretations are, are legion. Um, I actually invited, um, in fact, it was the year that Catherine took Isaiah with me. We invited a local Jewish rabbi in to speak to their traditional views on the servant. And that was even further enlightening. And he uh, confirmed to us that um, his tradition uh, prior to the strong emergence of Christianity, so 1200 uh, AD, would have affirmed that the servant figure was indeed a messianic figure. And then uh, Jewish interpretation backed away from that particular interpretive scheme when the church championed it. But this was an early interpretation of the servant himself, um, always enigmatic, so much so that um, Devet De actually made the argument that the servant songs were an alien corpus to the book of Isaiah, that they don't belong in Isaiah. This is introducing a whole new idea that cannot be reconciled with the rest of the book. And I love the fact that Brevard Childs was willing to stake currency on that one and say, absolutely not. You know, this, this is core material here. Um, so the servant himself, hotly debated. What I find so intriguing about the history of interpretation is actually what the New Testament writers do. You know, that in the midst of their struggle to figure out who is this Christ, this is not who we expected, they latch on to this identity and fulfill it. Um, as regards the image, there were a lot of um, whispers out there of people making these connections. Certainly the first Adam, the last Adam, um, uh, the connections between Genesis 126 and Colossians were out there. But it really wasn't until uh, the Assyriological translations, and I've got two books with me that both of which I will recommend to you very highly. Um, until this material, actually, and everyone at this table is going, oh yes, um, the, uh, the Miss P ritual was fully translated and we came to understand what it meant. And then, of course, it takes about 20 years for biblical scholars to get a hold of what the Assyriologists are doing, sometimes 30, sometimes more, um, and then pull it into biblical studies. Studies. Michael Dick was probably the first one who really pop popularized, um, it's not ex exactly in the newspaper, but popularized the material. And then my friend and colleague, Kathy McDowell at Gordon-Conwell, has really written this into biblical theology. And almost everything I've learned about this material, I've learned from her. So I would say in the last, Lawson, help me out with this. When would you say this material actually got into biblical studies? Would you say? Uh, really around the 1990s. OK. So, so it's fresh. And for us, it's fresh. Um, and for me, has transformed my take. I am, I am so overwhelmed that Isaiah actually saw this on the horizon, that Isaiah could actually stand in the middle of our canon and tag the image in the garden and look ahead to someone he didn't know. So if you're looking to do more research, those are the books. I'll, in fact, would you like to look at them? I will hand them to you. Um, Fascinating. Thank you very much. All right, I didn't get much laughter, which means you're a very stuffy conservative crowd. So, just kidding. Can, can I show you another image while you think of your next question? Um, I am on, on top of being a scholar, yes. I'm also a mom, 
And as a mom, um, I, of course, got lassoed into teaching toddler church at my um, Anglican uh, church uh, back when I worked at Asbury Theological. A uh, toddler church is very challenging to people who are, you know, abstract learners. And in the midst of this, my little three, four-year-olds, I asked them to draw a picture of God. And we had just finished the creation narratives with them. And my own budding theologian drew this instead of God and got a big yellow crayon colored all over it. And I came over and I said to her, Elise, what? What is that? And she said, and this is my kid, she said, you asked me to draw a picture of God. I can't draw a picture of God. So I drew Adam instead. I almost started sobbing in the middle of toddler church. I'm like, wow. yes, yes. So um, that's, that's great. Back to you. Other questions? So be a, a little bit uninformative. I'm thinking and processing out loud, but let me two observations and then raise a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so this lecture is coming in the context of the creation project, of course, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that strikes me as interesting about the book of Isaiah uh, is the cosmic scope that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking yesterday about how Tohu, like half the occurrences of Tohu are in the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. um, first observation, second, and this one I think you did a wonderful job of showing the ancient mind and, and mm -hmm. how the, um, the logic of idols mm -hmm. or gods works. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, I think, as I was thinking about your presentation, there's a, we have this contrast between like materialism and the mythology or the mythical mind. Mm -hmm. And um, so it struck me the way that you're presenting idols, you already see Isaiah questioning that mythical Mytho notion of reality. Mythopoeic thought. Myth mm -hmm. Right, and the sort of sacramental, or however you want to talk about this idea that the material world has some kind of divine being to it, such mm -hmm. that this thing could be God. And Isaiah's saying, no, it's just, it's just a tree. Mm -hmm. um, so putting those two observations together mm -hmm. in the context that we're in, does Isaiah have any insights for us on how we think of creation between, on the one hand, imbued it with the divine, and on the other hand, merely matter? Mm. Um, thank you, Jeffrey, for a great question. One of the topics on the outline that I realized I probably would not have time for, and so if you were paying very close attention to, I ditched it, um, is the differences between polytheistic and monotheistic thought, which is the worldview issue. And to this day, my great hero on this topic is Yezekiel Kaufman. And he is a Jewish theologian. He was one of the responders to Wellhausen, actually. And uh, people, of course, you know, our, the, the, what is the Oedipal complex? We are destined to try to kill our fathers and has come under much criticism. But his insight here, I think, is profound. Uh, his response, and don't let me go too far afield, the question he was answering was, could monotheism have evolved out of polytheism? This is the standard university line that we've gone from the many of polytheism to the uh, single uh, allegiance of henotheism to the ultimate monotheism. And in that evolution, which of course is three stages, because all evolutionary paradigms should be three stages, right? So like, um, as it ought to be, that we've gone from the simple to the complex, we've gone from the concrete to the abstract, we've gone from the imminent to the transcendent. And Kaufman responded and said, that is a wholly inadequate way of dealing with the differences of this profound distinction of worldview between polytheism and monotheism. And what Jeffrey is tagging, as you look on the left, uh, of a very distilled version of Kaufman's argument is that because there are multiple deities in the heavens, we must first affirm that every deity is therefore limited. Because if Baal is fighting it out with Asherah, who's biting, fighting it out with Marduk, who's fighting out with Shamash, who's fighting out with the Greek pantheon, every one of them has limited power. This places the worshiper in a profoundly insecure state. Because of course, if you make any one of them angry, they can do damage. And so the pious individual in the ancient world added on to their pantheon constantly and tried desperately to keep all the gods happy. 
So this is one issue. Another issue is that the deities therefore have limited territory, which is why Baal is indigenous to Canaan, and Jeroboam the first brilliant exercise in contextualization is to actually syncretize Yahweh and Baal because he keeps everybody happy except for Yahweh in that process. Um, the deities, because they are um, themselves multiple, and uh, let me add to this point, pantheons are constantly expanding. The gods are either birthing new gods or new deities are being assimilated every time a country is contacted either through military acquisition or trade or anything else. Because of that, with these pantheons constantly expanding, the ancients who were polytheists had to understand that the gods could reproduce and they could be reproduced, which is very important, which necessarily forces us to ask, where do the gods come from? And the answer is that they come from the primordial realm. This is critical because it means that gods are being created. We can create more. And if the gods come from primordial stuff, you know, you think of Tiamat being split in half, her primordial stuff, the chaos, then if you can control the primordial stuff, you can control the gods. And that is the essence of magic. And this is where your question connects. If the gods are embedded in the creation, if they share their personhood, their ontology with creation itself, then we can get to the gods through creation. We can cast spells. We can manipulate magic. We can do divination. We can manipulate them like Utnapishtum does when he gets off the ark. Ah, they're hungry. If I put together a big enough barbecue, they will come to me and I can ask them for my life and they will give it to me. So this business about the gods deriving from the primordial realm, I think is Kaufman's stroke of brilliance. You cannot get from there to monotheism. You, can't, you cannot cross that great divide. And of course, the end result is that deities need humans. And this plays into the Miss P ritual, of course. Whereas the god of monotheism is omnipotent, omnipresent, ex nihilo, this is a god who has no need. So as we speak into our current context, which is quickly reverting to a very comfortable, socially acceptable version of paganism. We still hold a God who is unique in this identity, one who is still uniquely offensive in this identity, and one who demands allegiance and the only possible response is submission. Did, have, have I touched? Keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right now, Bobby, you just made an interesting contrast. We would, I think we would tend to still think of ourselves as a, a totally different world than the ancients. Mm -hmm. uh, we're materialists, we're enlightened. Mm -hmm. um, they believed in those idols. Mm -hmm. And you just said that actually they're, we're turning into a society that's more like them, not mm -hmm. and Christianity, Christian theism is the, mm -hmm. the outlier. Maybe could you keep going oh. a little bit with that continuity that you're having? Um, absolutely. I, I think that the average person's theology tends very much toward polytheism. Uh, that there is, um, oh, let me see, how am I gonna put this together? Humanity always has been, and I think always will be, very uncomfortable with a sovereign deity. A single God who stands outside of our realm and has the authority to make us in his image and remake us in his image. Who, whose identity is not something that can be abstracted into, for example, um, a philosophical discussion of, of polytheism versus monotheism. Um, for example, a very hot debate on my campus is the Muslim Christian question. And uh, the, one of the responses will be, well, there is only one God, so of course Muslims and Christians worship the same God. And one of my responses to that is, who are you talking about? Not what are you talking about, but who are you talking about? Monotheism is not simply a category of unique allegiance 
to a single God. It is unique allegiance to a person who is God and has, therefore, boundaries on his personhood. Um, how can I add to that? You might need to, to encourage me further. Uh, we, we are very comfortable with the idea of God somehow being embedded in his creation in modern thought. Um, the New Age movement is, is basically a resurrection of Hinduism with better clothes. Um, <laughs> Uh, am, I, am I being radical? It's hard to tell up here. You're very quiet. <laughs> How about the positive? What is, what, what is Isaiah's view of creation and God's relationship to the world? How does that shed light on how we think about... Oh, is that what... Oh, that the, oh okay. Well, um, Isaiah sees the created order as one of the ultimate reflections of the character and the personhood of God. He sees this as the work of his hands, the work of his fingers. He entrusts creation to the one made in his image. Uh, as a result, I would say that Isaiah's theology of creation is that it is highly esteemed, it is precious, and it belongs to the Almighty, not to humanity. This is a major thesis in my work on environmentalism, that uh, the, the, the question that should be posed when you ask the environmental question is who does it belong to? That's the ultimate question. And if it does not belong to humanity, then an aspect of humanity's submission to the Almighty is their care for his material. I don't know if that helps. I might be missing you, Jeffrey. Hello. This is Heather Poulette, who graduated from Asbury Theological Seminary. She also spent three weeks at Tel Rehov um, being covered in dirt, <laughs> uncovering the Iron Age with me. Go ahead. It was awesome. Um, OK, so I just wanted to say I really appreciated a lot of the things that you've brought up in your presentation from the beginning to where we just landed now. And I mm -hmm. think you're dead on when you talk about even the, a lot of Christians that we know having a, a polytheistic mm -hmm. view, even if they don't acknowledge it or even know it. Um, so my question kind of goes back, or it does go back to the, the Miss P um, mm -hmm. ceremony, and especially going back to Genesis, where you, you pulled out one and two about God forming and breathing humanity, or breathing into humanity and, and kind of activating you know, his cellum there. Mm -hmm. Yes, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you go further into Genesis 3, then we get into the serpent's deception and, and the fall and all of that. And then the beginning of that kind of opens up with, you know, their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked and so they clothed themselves and all of those things. And I just was kind of thinking through, throughout your presentation, so many little dots were connecting back and forth. But I just think it's so interesting in having you detail um, well, the, the opening of the mouth ceremony mm -hmm. and, and honestly, I never connected that to what we do with babies. So mm -hmm. there's that too. Mm -hmm. But then how the Genesis narrator continues to kind of use some of those same, um, I don't know, phrases even to kind mm -hmm. of show like the fall. And then I was thinking too about Psalm 51 and, and this isn't so much a question as like a common mm -hmm. comment, I guess. So you feel free to agree or disagree or whatever. But going back to Psalm 51, where David is, you know, kind of pouring out his heart and mm -hmm. crying out to God to make him clean, make him whole, to restore him, mm -hmm. um, and he just pulls in a lot of language about, you know, ritual washing and opening like his lips to so that they can mm -hmm. bring forth praise to the proper, you know, I don't, I don't know. Just do, mm -hmm. is there a connection there, or it sounds like a really interesting seminar paper? Oh, great. Um, I, there, I, I immediately go to Psalm 8 when okay. I think of this material, but what I, what I love about the parallels that you're finding is that David is recognizing that his role is to live purely, to um, embody a proper witness to the character of his God. He realized that he's failed. He knows that his lips are supposed to be utilized to speak praises. So much of that psalm is rehearsing David's role as a servant of the Almighty. And he's recognizing that aspects of his performance 
have been compromised by a sin. I do like that very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think that you phrase things better. I appreciate that. And I think it ties back into what you were just saying a couple minutes ago about remembering who remembering what and who everything belongs to ultimately mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times people can get stuck reading through Genesis and thinking like hey we're we're the heirs we're the crowning jewel of, of everything mm -hmm. so everything goes back to us and we forget that everything doesn't it does all go back to God and remembering kind of not only proper place and knowing mm -hmm. that role but I think remembering like I don't know, I just, there have been some pieces in here that you've connected for me mm -hmm. in ways that I can't quite articulate yet, but just remembering who, who the glory actually belongs to mm -hmm. and how that's to be paid back is mm -hmm. significant, I think, especially with the environmental stuff that you're working in. So mm. thank anyway, you. thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sandra. John Kilner on the yes. faculty here yes. at TEDS. And uh, what a marvelous presentation that was about mm -hmm. how the, the whole scripture hangs together. Hmm. you know, from the, the beginning to the end and, and how that, that ties together. And then in light of that, that, that stimulated a question in my mind because you were, you were lifting up Jesus Christ as the image of God, which is a very clear New Testament teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the various passages in the New Testament that talk about people being renewed according to that image. Mm -hmm. So you have that, that kind of language. And then it brought to mind James kind of summarizing the Genesis account by talking about people being created according to the image mm -hmm. of God. And then the Genesis passages also always having some sort of preposition there, people being created according to the image, mm -hmm. people being renewed according to the image. Mm -hmm. like Do you see any has. significance mm -hmm. between, uh, any difference between Christ being the image, or saying that something is the image, mm -hmm. and, and, and people being created or renewed according to the image. Mm -hmm. I do, I do, and I, I thank you for, for making that explicit, that of course, uh, God the Son comes to us in Jesus the Christ. And so he is, the, he's the original, and yet, in his humanity, he is the image. And I'm going to leave this to the systematicians to figure out how both those things can be true. But this, for me, as an Old Testament person, is probably the greatest miracle of the Incarnation, that I have the nation of Israel being restored by the type man of Israel, who is God himself and yet is Adam. And how, Matthew's trying to do that in his genealogy, and uh, perhaps it's easier to accomplish in a genealogy than in a systematics book. You know, it takes me 400 pages to take that, to say that it took him a few verses. But yes, Jesus is being presented as the servant, as the original cast in the image. We are copies. We are not the original. Um, and that's a very obviously important part of New Testament theology. And that, that language is in there as well. Yeah. We have time for one more question. John, did you, you were making your way up. Thank you, Dr. Richter. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, not a prof, not a doctoral student, just a practitioner in the local church. I'm wondering if you could help me with the idea I mean, Isaiah is mocking, he's basically saying, my God's better than your God. Mm -hmm. Yes. They shared the assumption then of a two-story universe, a material world and a spiritual world. As a pastor, most of the people I encounter, not in the church that I'm trying to reach, they live in a world of brute fact. Cormac McCarthy, Kim Kardashian, celebrity without mm -hmm. substance. They so much believe only in brute fact of the here and now, mm -hmm. they don't believe in it two-story two universe hmm. or, or a spiritual world other than sort of I'm a spiritual because I use an iPhone and you have an Android. Um, hmm. How do we unmask the false idols when they don't see it as idol making mm -hmm. because you would have to assume a two-story universe. They just see it as the brute fact of existence. Hmm. I'll give you two examples. I had a young woman who came to my church 
24 heroin addict, started prostituting herself at 17. And I've got a guy who comes right now every Sunday, 82 years old. As a 10-year-old, he was in a Russian concentration camp in World War II. And because of the horrors of what she, he saw, even though he comes every Sunday, because we have a friendship, he can't even conceive of a good God who could exist. So how do I take Isaiah's unmasking vitals and the image of God in Christ, which are precious doctrines to mm -hmm. us, and make those matter and come alive to those who live in just a brute fact world? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, let me tag three things. And thank you, first of all, for being a practitioner and living on the front lines. Um, the first thing I would say is I think that the concept of idol worship gets tossed around in the popular pastoral literature um, too casually than it should. And I don't think we do our practitioners any um, favors by doing that. The, the core crime of idolatry, hear me on this, the core crime, what idolatry is, is making God in my image. That's the core crime. Jesus has lots of things to say about being wealthy. He has lots of things to say about um, frittering your life away with recreation. He has lots of things to say about sex and idol uh, adultery. But idolatry is making God in my own image. So when I'm sharing the gospel to someone who's had a, a really rough time and they've decided to create an alternate deity, and they say, my God would not do that. In my head, I say, ah, an idol worshiper. They have made God in their own image. Their God is comfortable. Their God is familiar. And they worship that deity. Actually, this is probably more of an epidemic in the church than um, uh, any sort of blatant polytheism or paganism. We recreate God in our image. We put our own character on him. We decide what he will and will not do based on our cultural norms as opposed to his revelation of himself. So this, that would be my first tag. The second one is if I were talking to your heroin addict, I would assume that her self-esteem is crushed beyond therapeutic repair. I would assume that she despises herself and has a great deal of trouble sleeping at night or looking too long in the mirror. So I would love to tell her that there is a God who can recreate her, a God who can take what is broken and what in her mind is shameful and can rebirth it. And her brute facts cannot be addressed by education, therapy, or wealth. She needs, a new, she needs a new soul, this girl. So that would be what I would say to her. And of course, it would take years, right? Um, to the Auschwitz victim, is this, was it Auschwitz? Is that what you said? Our, my, my dean uh, at Wheaton is a poet, and she wrote a poem about the Holocaust that still haunts me. And there was a line in it about how the numbers on our arms were phone numbers to heaven that no one ever answered. Some such line, very powerful. That man has been betrayed. And the one he trusted in his mind has thrown him under the bus. Um, I would talk about a fallen world. I would talk about the necessity of a recreation. That it's not that bad things happen to good people, it's that this is a fallen, broken, poisoned, marred world. And the only hope is the day of Yahweh, when both justice and judgment come hand in hand. He needs 
and I, I know I'm waxing eloquent here, but that man needs Yahweh to show up and split the clouds and deal with his abusers. And we don't like to talk about that in Western contemporary culture. You know, we're, we're not supposed to have anyone that we hate, but I'm going to guess he has people who he hates. And um, I think I, I firmly believe Isaiah addresses that um, in the need that must, mercy and justice must go hand in hand. But I think that guy's going to... You're going to have to do a miracle there. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Last word. You, conformed to the image of God, will eventually speak to his broken heart. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Richter. That is so both theologically rich and, and so pastorally sensitive. But would you join me in uh, just, just thanking Dr. Richter again? <laughs> And would you please stand for a benediction, and then we'll send you on your way. As you go, may the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the one who is the image of God, mm. and may the love of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you very much.